All right, so Risto here with George Mason University. Uh, we got another episode here of playing with research in health and physical education. Uh, today we're talking to Jamie McMullen, who is an associate professor at uh, University of Northern Colorado. And uh, she's in the sport pedagogy physical education program there as an associate professor. And we're just here to talk about the doctoral process in, uh, in physical education. We talked to uh, Justin Hagel, um, a couple episodes before about the adaptive PE programs and so we wanted to kind of get a little introduction so um, can you just briefly describe you know what a student does when they go into UNC like what are the types of classes that they take um, everybody does a, a dissertation I'm assuming all that good stuff yeah, well, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, to contribute to the podcast. Um, I feel like just briefly would be to summarize all of the duties of a PhD student. Um, just briefly would do them a disservice and my students would probably get really mad at me to say that I could describe what they do briefly. But um, essentially what our program looks like is, um, you know, students take either three or four years. Um, a lot more of our students are taking four years than three, um, to be fair, but we do have some students that are definitely on the three-year timeline, um, and it is possible to get done in three years. Um, and they take a variety of coursework. Um, they develop, when we first get here quite early, what we call a program of study, um, and they'll decide essentially on areas of interest that they want to take classes in. Um, they have to take certain classes, so we have a core group of classes here at UNC, which a lot of universities, I think, have, and then we also have some elective tracks. Um, they also have to take classes in research methodology, um, and that involves both quantitative and qualitative methodology. Um, the students that come work with me um, are generally more interested in qualitative methods, so usually probably take more qualitative methodology courses than a whole lot of statistics classes for example. Um, but yeah, so the first kind of two, two and a half years, students are generally working on coursework and then they shift more to their formal dissertation process. Um, typically, once they wrap up their coursework, kind of jumping back a little bit, um, students complete their comprehensive exams and comprehensive exams are basically the student's opportunity to demonstrate the knowledge that they've acquired through the coursework that they've taken um, and all of the other experiences that they've had with research and or service um, throughout their PhD program. Um, so if you're on a three-year timeline, you'd likely do your comprehensive exams in the spring of your second year, and then you follow on in the fall of your third year with your dissertation proposal and then collect your data, and then if all goes well, defend your, your dissertation in the spring of your third year. Um, students on a four-year plan likely slow that down a little bit and might do their comps, for example, in the fall of their third year, start to work on proposal in the spring of their third year, and then use that fourth year for dedicated to dissertation. So part of it depends on, I think, what students are interested in and kind of the timeline that they're on. Um, but within that, um, a lot of our students, especially if they're on assistantship, um, which all of our students are right now, um, will have either research and or teaching experiences um, that they have to do as well. So um, most of our assistantships are teaching assistantships so that they will teach um, some of our lower level undergraduate classes, but then also be teaching assistants on some of our um, methods classes and upper level coursework as well. With our undergrad. So what types of classes would a uh, doctoral student expect to teach if they're teaching by themselves? What are those lower level classes for you? Yeah, so um, for example, right now, one of our PhD students is teaching um, a few sections of stress management, um, which is a, it's a sport and exercise science course, but it's general education kind of course. It's not necessarily for our majors. Um, but they will also teach things like dance activities, which is a required class that our majors have to take. Um, track and field, they might teach. Um, this semester, we have um, one of our TAs is actually teaching some online strength and conditioning courses. And you also talked briefly earlier about a teaching internship course. 
so a teaching internship course where they have to um, organize observations um, for students out in the field. And so we have one of our PhD students, Colin Brooks, he's teaching that this semester. So he has to be the one that gets in touch with all of the teachers and schools to set up these observation hours with these students um, who are in uh, co-enrolled in an intro to PE class. So they're usually about sophomores at that stage. So it, it ranges from general activity courses that aren't necessarily for our majors all the way up to required classes for our majors um, that they would teach by themselves. And they are technically on our methods classes. They are listed as the instructor of record on the lab section. So most of our upper level methods classes have a three credit lecture component and then a one credit lab component or field component. And while we do a lot of our work collaboratively with our PhD students, so it's almost more of like a co-teaching arrangement um, for their CVs, which is the really important part, they are listed as the instructor of record for those lab sections, which is great for them because it shows that additional teaching experience. Yeah, so they're getting a line on the CV in addition to that experience. So yeah. you got some TA stuff. And... The research, what types of research opportunities are available? Because, you know, in your doctoral program, you know, a lot of times you're thinking, what is my, you know, dissertation? What is my research going to be? Whereas, you know, sometimes you don't realize that you're going to be on other research projects leading up to it. Um, so how many different projects are they on? Are, are students often on one project that takes a couple years or individual ones how does that play out there so right now he, um, we have um, associated with our program we have um, the active schools Institute it's our research Institute and so there are funding opportunities available through the active schools Institute for our program for example and a lot of that is attached to large grants that we've received in the last few years so for example one of our PhD students is actually fully funded by a grant that we received through the Colorado Health Foundation. And so um, right now, a lot of the work that she does, she doesn't do any teaching assistantship. Um, a lot of the work that she does contributes specifically to the work of that grant and to the work that we're doing through the Active Schools Institute. Um, and so some of her dissertation, because she's actually in that phase right now, is coming from that work, but some of it's not. And so I think that's maybe where you're going with that is that people have different kinds of experiences. I think philosophically, as a program, we're all kind of on the same page that we want our students to come in and in the first year, for example, get them involved in kind of smaller pilot projects or assisting on projects that we as faculty already have going on. Um, and then they progress to more independent research. So in their second and third years, for example, they start to be the ones that you know, come up with the concept for a research project and actually do most of the research process themselves um, versus that kind of first year where, you know, they're just learning research methodology, they're just learning about ethical considerations and all of those things. So we try to get them involved in things that are ongoing um, and do kind of small pieces, sometimes attached to stuff that they're doing in their coursework because a lot of their courses require them to do you know, mini research projects and things like that, um, and then kind of um, scale that up from there. Right, and and I think that there are there are PhD students in other fields that may come in and jump in on a project, and then they end up writing their dissertation off a piece of that major funded project, and that sometimes happens, and sometimes it happens like you said, bringing them in on smaller projects giving them a research assistant position or then something that leads to publication if they're really into it and doing that work, then graduating into their own uh, research. So there's there's a lot of different ways definitely to go about that. Um, so let's say if I'm a doctoral or if I want to go into a PhD and I want to get funded, what's my what's my step? If I know that I can't afford a ton of money to go to a PhD, how, how would you recommend somebody without knocking on your door and saying, hey, do you have a funded position? Because 
that turns people off. Yeah. So. I mean, we do get asked that a lot. And honestly, I mean, I think when I get approached from potential students, that's generally one of the first three questions they ask is, do you have funding available? And, you know, we do. However, it is competitive. We don't have endless assistantships. Um, so, for example, my department, or sorry, I'm part of the School of Sport and Exercise Science and we are a program within that school. So our program is physical education and physical activity leadership. And our program will get um, allocated a certain amount of assistantships um, from our entire school. Um, and, and I would say that, you know, and, and some of my colleagues in doctoral physical education, teacher education might agree or disagree with me, but it's getting harder and harder to find funded positions, I think. Um, you know, there's less and less assistantships available because of, you know, the financial climate within universities. And um, so I do think that, you know, trying to find places that are receiving larger grants and things like that is a good strategy for a PhD student um, to, you know, find schools that have, you know, bigger grant funded projects that potentially have more opportunity for them to receive some funding. So for example, for us, <coughs> we have our, our funded positions for lines through the Active Schools Institute, but then there's also like hourly research positions that come up that aren't necessarily going to fund you to do your PhD, but might give you additional income so that you can kind of offset some of the costs with that. Um, so, you know, I do think that, you know, it's, it, the money is, is, a, is a thing and I don't think that there's a lot of people pursuing PhDs in, in physical education, te teacher education right now without funding. Um, so I do think it's actually something that, while it might be off-putting to some people, I think it is a question that needs to be asked relatively quickly in the process, especially if it isn't something that you can afford um, to do without the funding. And so, you know, we're pretty transparent, I think, here um, with the fact that, you know, yes, we have assistantships, but they are um, awarded on a competitive basis and not everyone who applies is going to get it. And um, so my suggestion, except for people applying to our program, only apply to our program, but to everybody else, you know, apply to several different programs because, you know, the money is going to be a big piece and a big barrier. Um, with that said, I think that the first thing that you need to think about as a, do a potential doctoral student is a match with an advisor. Um, I think that's more important than funding. But then again, I, when I was a candidate, got to choose my advisor and get funding. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I got the advisor I wanted and the funding that I needed. So. Um, that's not always going to happen. So I think, yeah. you know, those are a couple questions to ask. And I, and I think that, um, you know, the article by Ann Boyce that just talked about doctoral PEAT programs, um, it does show that trend of declining funding. And it shows that it, you know, was high and slowly it's been less and less um, percentage of doctoral students who are getting some sort of active funding. Um, which is a serious thing, and I, and I think you're, the advice is right, is to get that in a conversation early to understand what you're looking at, but also don't go where the money is, go where the researcher is that you want to work with and the program that you want to work with, and then you know figure out if that's a fit, then ask about how the, how the funding works. Um, let me ask you a couple questions about your uh, core coursework. Um, so you have qualitative classes. Um, what types of advanced qualitative classes do you uh, do you have your your specific graduate students who work with you take? Yeah, so I mean, it really is up to kind of their interests. And I think for me, the whole point of a PhD program is to prepare students to get a job when they finish, right? We, we want our PhD students to graduate and be able to get the job that they want. Um, and are they always gonna get this first, like their top major choice? No, um, but we want them to be marketable enough to be able to get that, whether it's not, maybe it's not their first choice right away, but eventually. So 
for me, for example, I look at the kind of work that my students want to do, and then we try to fill the gaps with with the classes that they take. So what are the things that they excel at that they've already maybe taken coursework in? You know, I'm going to, you know, it's, I specifically, I think my PhD students would agree with this, that this challenge them to take things that are going to expand their skill set. So not just take, you know, six of similar classes or classes that are similar to things that you did in your master's degree, because to me, you become more marketable the, the wider your skill set is. So um, I think from the standpoint of specific classes, that's going to vary by student. Um, and, you know, right now I've got a student taking like a case studies course, and I have another student taking an advanced narrative um, methodology course. And so I think, you know, different universities have different offerings with respect to that. We're really, last year I think we've got quite a few um, really great people that offer some of our qualitative research methods courses. And those are offered outside of our um, school. They're offered in um, like a qualitative research methodology um, department. So um, we're lucky from that standpoint, they actually have quite a few different options that they can take. Um, but that is something I think to also, you know, ask. And I don't know that doctor, like people looking at doctoral programs are often thinking about the coursework that they're gonna take outside of the department. But I think it's important, you know, I know for me in my own experience, you know, I was so excited because I went to Arizona State, had one of the, you know, top education departments at the time. And so I got to take classes from, you know, Berliner and Mary Lee Smith and these people that like, you know, I'd read about in educational theory. Um, and so that was, you know, huge in my kind of decision to pursue the path that I did because I knew I could take those classes there. Um, but you know, I think that that's not always something that's top of mind to people. Um, yeah, the yeah. uh, Berliner came in and gave this awesome scholar lecture at Teachers College when I was in grad school, and I can only imagine having him as a as a teacher for for a semester uh, at had a Teachers. Last yeah. Year he retired so that was great. yeah that's awesome yeah so at teachers college it was interesting for me um because laura azarito was there she had just came in the same year as me so she offered so i had my qualitative research methods class that was in the curriculum and teaching but then she offered these two classes one was a qualitative research methods in physical culture and then visual methodologies in uh, and physical education and physical culture, which were super cool to just have the qualitative piece inside PE because it is beneficial to have it in the College of Education or curriculum and teaching, but then to have somebody teach you the methods in those practical examples was really cool for me. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's even something, I mean, it's maybe an advanced question, but like, you know, it is important. It is important to be able to get some of those, you know, research methodology and classes and stuff in your own discipline because, you know, it's a lot oftentimes easier to make those connections between, you know, what you're with what you're doing and um, what you're being taught. So I think that that is important. Um, one thing to talk about with our coursework as well is we've done something. We just did a revision of our PhD program um, two and a half years ago. And as I was actually coming into this position, we were finishing up the revisions, and I guess throughout that year. And we decided on two kind of distinct tracks um, to try to make our program um, a little bit more marketable and attractive to different types of people entering PhD programs. And so we have our um, physical education, teacher education track, which is like our you know, traditional PEAT track. But then we also have a physical activity leadership track, which is more um, aligned with public health outcomes, I would say. So school-based still, um, but kind of more along the public health side. And um, you know, we did this very purposefully, sort of looking at kind of the trends within physical education, teacher education, and looking at from the standpoint of you know comprehensive school physical activity programming, and we have several faculty here who that's our research interest. So kind of aligning, trying to attract students who might be 
um, more interested in that area by having a specific kind of elective track um, where there's different courses that they can take um, that are more kind of aligned with public health. And um, I think that that's been really interesting to kind of see students negotiate that, coming in thinking, oh, I'm for sure going to do the physical education, teacher education track, but then, you know, saying, well, like, I kind of already know curriculum theory, and I kind of already know these things, so maybe I'll look at this different area to, like I said, expand the skill set. And so I think it'll be interesting to see. We technically, um, this year is our first year that students are on um, that specific program. So none of our currently enrolled students are required to do that, but they are sort of choosing those from their program of study. And it's been quite interesting to negotiate that, um, seeing those choices happen and, and knowing what we know kind of about maybe where the field is going or you know where some people think it's going. Um, I think that's important to have those choices. Yeah. Does your undergraduate program reflect that? Because I just talked to um, Kevin Richards this morning about that and you know one of the recommendations they had in their monograph for JTPE was to broaden an undergraduate major to have that traditional hey this is going to lead to licensure but then also training physical activity leaders in out of school slash in school settings so at, what's your yeah. under does it mirror the undergraduate program at all? So we're toying with from the undergraduate perspective toying with um, adding in some kind of minors or concentrations. Um, we're not there at this point. Um, we do actually, UNC has a Master's of Arts in Teaching in Physical Education and Physical Activity Leadership. And so essentially that Master's program um, is the training of physical activity leaders um, in a very high level scale. So um, UNC made a determination quite early on that um, and I think this is something, you know, we have so much to teach in undergraduate programs. Our curriculums, and there was, I know there was a Twitter chat happening over the last several days around, you know, different requirements for programs. We have so much to pack into programs that we felt um, at UNC, and this preceded me getting here, but I agree with the philosophy, um, that if we were going to also train people to be leaders of physical activity, that that probably needed to be something outside of the traditional PEAT program. So we developed this two-year online master's program. It doesn't lead to licensure, so it, it sh it's geared towards people who are already school professionals. Um, we have classroom teachers, physical education teachers, um, lots of different, actually from different backgrounds enrolled in our program. This is the third full year that it's going through. So we'll have our third um, cohort graduating in spring. And um, yeah, it's two years online. They come to campus for two weeks in the summer. And so our undergraduate students are very well aware of comprehensive school physical activity programming. And we kind of, you know, weave it throughout our program, but then they also know that if it's something that they're interested in, they want kind of that advanced degree um, that they can get the master's degree after they finish. Right, and are these uh, students in the master's program, are they from Colorado mostly, or are they all across the nation? Yeah, I mean, definitely we started off with more of a Colorado focus, I would say, um, but we have actually had a couple international students now in our cohorts. Um, one student actually who was teaching at an international school in Myanmar, um, just graduated last spring, and uh, we now have, I think, this current cohort that started in the fall um, are from, I want to say, like eight different states or something. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's something that there's not a lot of online physical education related um, master's degrees. And so and I think this idea of physical activity leadership and that it's for everyone in the school, not just PE teachers, because we know it needs to be, you know, broader than that. Um, we're getting a lot of a lot of interest in the program and have had, you know, full cohorts every year. Right. So. And I think I think the word that you missed there is online quality physical education programs. Yeah. Because that's so we're launching ours this summer. Uh, so we're taking in it's the advanced studies and teaching and learning and physical education. It's fully online, asynchronous program, and students can, you know, 
take those advanced study classes after they have a teaching job already, right. do it asynchronously online, use their classrooms as a research site, and actually implement the theory, the research, the curriculum stuff, the supervision and mentorship, and all of that into their master's program and learn about you know general education theory at the same time. And I think that, and I tried to look this up, and if you Google search you know master's programs in physical education, every quality program is buried in the in the search and you come up with all of these you know national university argosy university all these pay for play kind of places that none of those faculty are publishing in our field right right and then the people who run programs like you have a ton of scholars at unc that publish in that specific area that you know you have russ carson they're publishing on CSPAP, and then that's a driver for that master's program. Right. But I don't, I don't know if people like can find it in the right way. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it's hard. I think um, to find the the we know. I would say like within the field, the people who are active within the field kind of can know to point people in the right direction. But I feel like from someone coming from outside trying to like, you know, figure it all out, I'd say it's really challenging. Even to find the, the doctoral programs, I mean, for us, you know, as you know, we've been having this Twitter chat for a couple of weeks now about who has what programs and what programs are currently accepting. And, you know, there should be some kind of easier way to um, to find out that information for somebody who is just interested in coming kind of from outside. Um, bringing the conversation back to our, our doctoral program, though, one of the great experiences that our doctoral program, our doctoral students can have is they can actually do what we call a 755. It's a course that they can take, um, and they're essentially, um, they're not a TA, they're, they're a co-teacher, um, but they can teach upper-level classes with us. So we often, my PhD students do 755s with me with my online master's classes. So they'll teach, the classes are offered in eight week blocks. Um, so this, the professionals in the schools are only taking one class at a time in our master's program. And so when my students come on to a course, they'll take two weeks of the, of the eight weeks and they'll help plan the content and grade the assignments and communicate with um, our students through our online platform. And I feel like that's a really great experience that they get, uh, not only to deliver online education, which I think is something that is a really hard thing to teach and learn, um, but also um, teach within a master's program, which is another thing that they can add onto their CV, um, which is a great um, thing for them when they get out. Right. I'm, I'm just on a search committee now, and that was one of the things that you ask, like, hey, do you have experience teaching online? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you can't answer that positively... I don't know if it's a huge knock, but it's a smaller knock on your on your Vita. So I, I think that's great. Um, are your are your students getting jobs? I guess that's the uh, that's the big question. Of yeah. Are they are they getting placed? Come to UNC, you'll get a job. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming we're talking about doctoral students again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, we um, we since. Everyone I can think of that I know of that's graduated from the program, I want to say within the last five to six years, um, you know, because my history doesn't go back so super far with UNC. Like I said, I'm in my third year here, um, but all of our recent graduates are currently working within um, PEAT or a related field that is of their choosing. So we, up until last, well, I want to say two years ago, um, sport coaching was combined in our with our program. And so we had students in coaching and physical education um, within the same sport pedagogy program. But as I mentioned earlier, we've kind of rebranded as physical education and physical activity leadership. And sport coaching has actually gone more aligned with the um, psych soch folks within our department. Um, and so, um, you know, I, yeah, all of our PE graduates um, have jobs and, um, 
one started this year at Western Washington and one um, at uh, West Georgia, I want to say. Okay. So, yeah, so they're getting jobs in Pete and quite successfully. That's awesome. Uh, so let me let me bring back a little bit of a kind of side story here. So you, you've only been at UNC for three years, but you just got tenure. Congratulations. Um, but before that, you were in a very um, different program in a different country. You were in Ireland. Can you explain the difference between the Irish system or the main differences between the Irish system of getting a PhD there versus, and I know you didn't get your PhD at, in Ireland, but uh, like, what's the main difference between getting a PhD in Ireland versus a traditional U.S. institution? Yeah, so there's several key differences, I'd say. And, um, and I think um, Pete's, doctoral Pete education is starting to shift a little bit worldwide. Um, traditionally, in Europe, um, it was, you know, research by master's or research by publication, or sorry, research, a PhD by research or publication. And so um, your entire program was essentially dedicated to you developing as a researcher. And you, know, you might have had opportunities to teach within the department or whatever that you were working within. But coursework, formal coursework, was not a big part of the, the, the program. Um, University of Limerick, which is where I was in Ireland for three years prior to coming um, to UNC, um, when I got there, they actually started implementing what they call the structured PhD program that did actually include some coursework uh, that students were required to take alongside kind of their research, um, their research process. So I would say that's one key difference is that depending on the institution that you end up going to and the program that you end up going to, you may do only research and really no coursework. So it's really like a learn by doing kind of thing. So research methodology and everything you're reading about and like learning it by doing the actual research versus sitting in a class and learning about it and then going out and doing it. Um, so I would say that that's one key difference. Um, another key difference, and um, this might be like a, everybody's going to leave the U.S. and go to Ireland, but um, that I was kind of shocked by when I went there because I came through the traditional U.S. system of you get your undergraduate degree, you get your master's degree, and then you get your PhD. Um, you, uh, at the University of Limerick, and I guess in Ireland, but I can't speak to other countries because I'm not sure how they work, but um, you didn't need a master's degree. So essentially, people could come straight out of an undergraduate degree into a PhD program. Um, and I, I think that there's some students who are ready for that and are able to jump in and do that. Um, I know for me, for example, I drew a lot from my experiences from my master's degree as I was going into my PhD. So I don't know that that system would have worked very well for me, but we have a, a um, gal who I was on her committee while I was there and um, she just graduated and got a really great job in Australia and you know she did amazing and she came from an undergraduate degree had a few years of t PE teaching experience and then straight into her PhD. Um, but I also saw students come straight out of their undergrad. Um, and, you know, I think there's benefits and potentially challenges to that, to that scenario. Um, so that'd be a key difference. The other piece is, is that oftentimes um, in, in that system in Ireland, um, you'd apply for a specific PhD. So there would be funding attached to, for example, um, a PhD in this specific project. And so your, your PhD is essentially tied to either an advisor or a project through a line of funding um, that, that you apply for. So you apply and then that the funding is then applied for. So the, the way that people get assistantships is a little bit different, and I would say probably from country to country, I don't know if it's generalizable within Europe um, how, that, how that works within different programs. But again, it's the funding piece, right? So, um, you know, the funding is quite important because otherwise you're paying out of pocket for a PhD. Right. And it seems a little bit more rigid in a way if when you're going in there, you're saying, hey, 
this is the project that you're attached to, this is what you're going to school for, and getting your PhD as a result of it. Yes, you're getting paid, whereas maybe you could, you know, come to UNC and your assistantship is based on teaching strength and conditioning and you know stress management and being a part of this smaller maybe research study and doing a bunch of little things uh, over those three years but I think the the biggest difference when I try to explain this to uh, people who want to go up for a doctorate I say look if you go to Australia New Zealand UK Ireland there's a lot less coursework, but there's a lot more expectation that you know what you're doing and that you're going to be an independent super scholar. And so when I tell you that you need to understand what a case study research is, it's not you take a case study class over 16 weeks where a professor walks you through it. It's you're going to read these books and these articles and this methodology stuff, and you're going to figure it out and maybe you report back to me or maybe you don't. Yeah. We'll see and at I, the end, yeah. I think there's two things in there that's really interesting. I mean, I think that, um, you know, like I said, that shift is happening. I think that there's starting to become more value in in like a shared system. And, and, and one thing that I know, for example, my, one of my current PhD students, Colin Brooks, he was an elementary PE teacher for 10 years and then chose to come and get a PhD. And I mean, I don't think he, he would be mad at me for saying this, but, you know, probably every other month he's like, well, maybe I'm interested in this. Maybe I'm interested in this, like from a research perspective. And I think my personal philosophy is that, you know, I want my students to do what they're interested in. I also want it to, like, serve, you know, serve my interests. It sounds really bad. But, I mean, I want it to be aligned with things that I can help them with and that I'm interested in. Um, you know, and, and, and contribute to my research agenda as well. But at the end of the day, I don't want them doing something that they're miserable doing. So if they develop an interest in a certain area, I'm going to help to try to foster that for them. And I think, like you said, if you're tied to a particular project or a particular research question or something like that, that can become quite problematic because what if you get into it and you don't like it? And I think that that's the thing, I mean, I didn't know much about research when I started my PhD, and um, I always joke that um, Steve Harvey, who's a scholar in our field, he was an outgoing PhD student when I was coming in to work with Hans, and he took me for pizza um, on my visit across the street from Oregon State University where I started, and he said to me, so, what is your research interest? And I was like, ah, like it was such a scary question. I mean, I was a master's student. I was on spring break I was teaching high school PE at the time and you know on spring break and was out there just to like check out this program and here I have this guy grilling me on my research interests and you know and and while I think it's important for someone who's seeking out a PhD to have some idea of what they might be interested in I think sometimes you know allowing them to just have an interest in research and then figuring out what that is as they go is probably um it's definitely more of my style. Yeah. No offense, and, no offense to Steve. He knows he knows he freaked me out. Yeah. So I I remember Steve Silverman and I when I sat down on my interview with him, he drew these three circles and filled in his research interests. Like this is student attitude and this is teaching and physical education. And he's like, Look, if you fit in to one of these three bubbles, I can help you get your doctorate degree. I can guide you through it. If you're anywhere outside of here, this may not be the place for you because I just can't give you the support. Like, uh, you know, we probably like each other and you seem like a good person, but when it comes down to giving you advice on research and that topic, if you don't fit in these bubbles, it's going to be very hard and it's not going to be beneficial. And I think that, you know, I... I had done a master's thesis and defended and did that and thought that I knew what research was. And then, you know, when I got into grad school, I was like, oh, that was a crappy study that I did in, in my master's degree. This is we, research. We all, we all have them. We all have yeah. those studies. Yeah. So awesome. Um, so are there other things that um, you want to share about your program or 
uh, any deadlines, if people are still interested, are they able to contact you? Yeah, so um, we have a priority deadline every year, usually around the 1st of February, um, but that doesn't mean that we're not still accepting applications and we haven't allocated our funding yet for this year. So um, we still have assistantships up for grabs. And um, we also, like I said, have some funding potential through the Active Schools Institute um, for some students who might be interested in the work that we do there. We have a website, um, uncactiveschools.com, um, that folks can go to to find out uh, more about the work of the Institute. And um, they can also just search on unco.edu um, for the physical education and physical activity leadership PhD program that will provide a little bit more information on that. I recently actually tweeted out a flyer for our program as well. So if folks follow me on Twitter, they can maybe search for it there as well. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we're actively searching for new students. And I think one of the things you said, and, and you know, Steve Silverman knows what he's talking about, obviously he's been in this game a long time, right? And I think the one thing that we do really well here is if we don't think that you're going to fit, like we will let you know that, you know? So we have had students reach out to us and say, hey, I wanna do a PhD with you. And it's like, well, like, do you really, or do you wanna to come to Colorado because it's the best place in the United States? And I can see the rock, no, I can't actually see the Rocky Mountains out one window, I'm kidding. But, um, but I think that, you know, we're gonna be quite pragmatic with people because at the end of the day, I want more people in doctoral peak education I want more people to be getting PhDs in our field. So if I know there's someone out there who is going to be better for this person to work with, I'm gonna at least like try to connect them um, because I don't, I don't want someone coming here and not being fulfilled in what that they want to do, and vice versa. You know, so um, I think that you know, yes, contact us. Um, myself and um, we have two other faculty. We actually, you mentioned Russ Carson earlier. He actually um, has, uh, stepped out into the public sector, so he's no longer um, here accepting PhD students. Um, but you know, we have uh, two other faculty within our physical education and physical activity leadership um, program, Brian Downhower and Jennifer Krauss, who are both really high quality um, mentors as well, who are um, accepting students at the moment. So yeah, I mean, I think something I think that is worth people reaching out and exploring options. And my one piece of advice, I guess, if I had like to like the last piece of advice to people looking into programs is to really do the research. To don't just contact someone and say, you know, hey, uh, you know, copy and paste a letter saying, you know, I wanna do a PhD with you. Because my question back to you is always going to be, well, what are your interests and how do you think that they match with mine? And if you can't answer that, I'm gonna know that you really didn't do a lot of research into what I do. Or if you say something like, you know, oh, my interest is in, you know, self-determination theory and this, and I've never done any work in that area. And so I'm gonna, you know, question whether or not you're really invested in this process. So I would say to people, do your research, talk to as many people as you can, you know, try to meet them at conferences and stuff like that if you can as well. Um, the face-to-face -face piece is important. And um, we always encourage that here actually is to come for an on-campus visit um, prior to us even accepting you into the program um, because we want people to be, to know, walk into this with eyes wide open of what they're getting into. And do you have your, uh, do you have Colin Brooksy go out and take him out to pizza and ask him about their research interest just to scare him <laughs> off a little bit? He's, he's too nice. I'd have to find, we have actually a really, really nice PhD. Not, not that Steve Harvey <laughs> is going to come back to me with that one, but no, we need to like plant someone to, to do that pizza asking question. So. Yeah. And you're, and I saw on your website that you have some of your publications up there as well. So if people uh, want to go up, they can see some of your publications and your background, kind of understand what kind of research they do, uh, that you do as well, if they want to contact you. And uh, can you just say your Twitter handle again or yeah, for the first so time? Um, at Dr. Just D-R-J-M-C-M. -M. So the first three initials of my last name and my first initial. 
Awesome. At JMCM. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Hopefully this uh, helps some people out when they're thinking about what a doctoral program in Pete is. Appreciate it. Thank you.